Hello and good evening, everybody, or hello, wherever you are in the world, to the 11th episode of the Nova Insights, um, the series of interactive online lectures by Nova. My name is Till, and um, I work for Nova in marketing and PR and take care for the Nova Pilots team. And I have the honor to, to be the presenter. Um, a few words about the insights in general. We had the idea to do this series during Corona, when everybody was into Zoom conferences, no matter wh whether people wanted or not. And um, it was so well received that we decided to um, keep up doing it and um, got lots of positive feedback. Some technical things, um, we're planning to not do it longer than 90 minutes, hopefully a little bit less. It depends on, on your interest and how fast we can proceed. And um, if we say interactive, that means that you can ask questions. Um, however, if you want to ask questions, you have to subscribe to YouTube because um, without being YouTube subscriber, you cannot enter the chat. So um, if you want to ask questions, you have to subscribe. Um, something else, we hope there are no technical issues because we are actually working on Zoom and Zoom is linked to um, the live stream on YouTube, but um, last time it worked out, so we hope we can do it. Um, that you know, um, this episode will be recorded. So um, if you have to do something else, watch TV, brush your teeth, go to bed, have, have your dinner, um, you can watch it later on, so it's no problem. You can find, find it here on YouTube. Okay, today, um, Philip Medicus, the head of research and development at Nova is um, presenting the latest news on innovative paraglider development using the latest simulation tools. Hello, people. Maybe you can introduce yourself a little bit more than I have just done, and then I pass it on to you. Hello. Thanks, Till, for the introduction. Um, yeah, I am uh, working in the Nova R&D department, and uh, my job is mainly designing paragliders. I have been working for Nova in the R&D team for more than 10 years now. So yeah, I've, I've got a, a little bit of experience and insights and would like to introduce the latest ones to you. OK, so. The, stair, the, the stage is yours. <laughs> All right. I will quickly share the screen. Um, which is... So. Okay, it you, works. We can see it. Perfectly. You should see my slides. Yeah, I'm talking about innovative developments and simulation tools. My presentation uh, will cover three topics mainly. I will start with, sorry, small, ah, no, it works. Uh, I will start with explaining what a paragliding design software actually does. I will then continue to talk about the latest simulation possibilities we have. And last but not least, um, I will try to explain you uh, what the, how the final ring actually benefits from all those software tools. I will start with the design software. Uh, whenever I'm talking about design software in this presentation, uh, I am talking about our own proprietary design software. Uh, we call it Wing Designer, and it's an ongoing development which has started around uh, five years ago. And yeah, I am. I'd like to show you today uh, what the latest developments are and how the wings benefit from them. This slide is about um, what the design software actually does. I will go through that step by step. And those steps are actually 
in historical order. Uh, that means the first topics I'm going to cover uh, the ones which the first design softwares back in the days already had or had to have. And the further I progress, the more uh, advanced it's going to get. So most obviously, uh, the design software needs to start with some definition of the wing which shall be designed. Um, in, in our case, or in any case, this definition consists of thousands of parameters. I will just show a quite trivial one in this screenshot. You see the definition of the cell count and the definition of the cell width. So that's quite trivial, but even for this um, simple example, you there's already a lot of room for optimization. For example, you can um, have very narrow cells on the wing tip, or you can make them a bit wider on the wing tip and therefore more narrow in the center uh, with a given cell count. And it might turn out that one cell with distribution works very well for trim speed and another one works better. Um, for higher speeds. So if, even with this simple example, there's more room for optimization than one might think. And in the end, you obviously need a lot more to define a wing, to define its curvature, to define its wing twist, its line geometry, its airfoils, its ballooning, and so on. And there are different ways to count, but uh, it's yeah, around, 1000 parameters or more. And yeah, the difficulty obviously is um, to combine all those parameters optimally or uh, to get somewhat close to an optimal combination. But I will talk about it later. Then the most, then the design software reads this wing definition and the most crucial part of a design software is to create the cutting patterns. Uh, without cutting patterns, it's impossible to uh, sew the glider. And yeah, so the most basic functionality of a design software is to create those cutting patterns, but patterns based on the wing definition. The screenshot you see here shows um, around two thirds of the cutting patterns of an ion seven. Uh, and it's just one wing half since the wing is uh, symmetric. So it's actually one third of the um, total patterns of the glider you see here. Uh, may I yeah. just ask a question? Of course. Are you doing uh, the actual patterning or the, the cutting of, of the fabric um, with um, by manually with the, with the, these cutting knives or with um, is it is it laser cut? It's it's laser cut it. So the uh, after this um, pattern output, those patterns go through a so, a so called nesting software, which um, plays all those patterns. Uh, efficiently to not to, to lose as little as possible cloth and then the laser cutter cuts those parts. Before that, obviously, the parts have also to be sorted by color and material and then uh, the laser cutter cuts those parts. Um, and, uh, next logical step of uh, design software functionality would be the creation of 3D models. The, those 3D models are important for the visualization. So for, for me to, for me as a designer uh, to get an idea of how the glider really looks, but probably even more important as a basis for the simulations. I will talk about two different types of simulations. One is the airflow simulation. The airflow simulation computes the aerodynamic forces which are acting on the glider. So the, the air is either pushing or pulling on the wing surface. 
that uh, here you see a screenshot of that shows the pressure distribution of the wing. The blue color is the low pressure area where the uh, air is basically pulling on the glider, and the uh, red color shows the higher pressure area where the, um, the, the air is pushing against the wing surface. Uh, the second part of simulation I'm going to talk about in the next slides is the uh, structure simulation, which, as you can see here, shows deformations of the glider. I will, in the upcoming slides, I'll yeah, talk about the, those simulation methods a bit more in detail. Yeah, I will... There is one question about yes. the um, cutting the patterns. Yes. Um, and um, Stefan wants to know whether the software keeps the desired weave that uh, warp and weft into consideration. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. Yes. So the, for uh, probably not everybody understood this question. So I'm trying uh, to explain it. The, uh, the rip stop fabric uh, is characterized by those rectangle, in most cases, uh, quadratic aligned threads that go uh, through the cloth that give the cloth, cloth most of the, its strength. But the strength differs, differs a lot if you pull in the direction of those fibers or 45 degrees into the direction of those fibers. And so there is an optimal way how you orient the uh, rip of a glider, for example, on the cloth. And yeah, that's co that, that's considered. But yeah, that's a, but there is, I don't think uh, there is a paragliding manufacturer existing which would not consider the orientation of the cloth. So that's really, uh, yeah, that's really basic. So I will continue with the airflow simulation. There are different types of airflow simulations, and um, we are mainly using two different types. One is the so-called panel code. That's a quite simple simulation, which already existed in the 70s, where computers were really slow. Uh, yeah, th that's why. The method has to be simple, but uh, I still use it sometimes mainly, or actually only for 2D airfoil simulations to get a very first rough idea of the pressure distribution and the lift and drag uh, acting on an airfoil. The in principle, this method can only uh, can also do 3D, but yeah, I'm only using it to get a very quick, basically uh, real time idea of the pressure di pressure distribution, which is also what you see here in this screenshot. You see the arrows on the top side of the airfoil pulling upwards, and uh, the, uh, the the pressure curve visualizing basically the same in the upper half of the picture. What, what's the difference between the, the different red colored lines? Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's actually, that would <laughs> go a little bit too much into detail. I was, I, I, didn't, ex I didn't anticipate the question and I was too lazy to erase one of the two, but those are different uh, methods of um, those are different methods of uh, predicting the the flow separation. But the so the, the the different colors are different methods of predicting this uh, the flow separation, which can to a certain degree be done by this method as well. Um, but actually, to get a proper idea of flow simulation and even more turbulence, you need a more advanced simulation method. Uh, which is the CFD simulation. Um, 
uh, standing for computational fluid dynamics simulation. Um, the, a, a friend of mine recently told me that uh, he, he's uh, working in the car industry and uh, using CFD simulations, they, they call it colorful, colorful fluid dynamics. Uh, and the reason for that is it's quite complex to uh, handle it properly. It's quite easy to get colorful pictures, but it's a bit more complicated um, to get realistic results. But uh, once you get them, you uh, or once you uh, achieve that, you have something like a uh, virtual wind tunnels which shows a really realistic 3d airflow including turbulences airflow separations uh, airflow inside the wings and yeah all, all those small details but it's not only a bit more complicated and complex to use it's also the computational effort is also a lot higher and the reason for that is that the wing and the surrounding air is um, separated into millions of small element, elements. There are yeah, different ways of um, creating those elements, Clever, uh, some clever ones, some not so clever ones. Here's an example of how to do this. And yeah, you, you see that's uh, obviously a 2D cut through the wing and uh, until the whole 3D glider is covered and but by this mesh, you end up with uh, many millions of elements. And that's why the computational uh, effort is so high. But in return, you get a really accurate um, idea of the forces which are acting on the wings and uh, an, an accurate output of those forces, uh, forces acting on the wing, which then leads to a really accurate output of the lift of the drag and therefore of the glide ratio of the glider. Uh, I already mentioned you can also um, simulate the internal airflow. That's a picture of yeah, <laughs> an airflow including the opening. I highlighted the I, I highlighted the outline of the airfall to make the uh, to show the opening better. So you see here the airflow is passing by on the opening. And this airflow, which is passing by on the opening, basically powers uh, this um, rotational vortex, which is, in this case, uh, uh, clockwise rotating inside the airfoil, uh, inside or inside the, the wing, actually. Yeah, and uh, CFD allows to simulate those uh, kind of internal airflow and therefore obviously also the internal pressure and all kinds of other turbulences which are acting on the glider. So it's a really, really powerful tool if, uh, yeah, if used correctly. And it also uh, allows a nice visualization of the airflow around the glider and this is not just nice for uh, website or flyers, but it also strengthens the understanding. Uh, in, yeah, in this case, it strengthens my understanding if I can place basically virtual wool threads on the virtual glider that yeah, will, will then show me the uh, direction or the turbulence of the airflow. The, main limitation of this CFD simulation is the model is rigid. So it's basically a, a wing made out of whatever rigid material, which is far away from reality in case of a paraglider, as you know. The 
structural simulation is the simulation method that covers uh, this problem. Basically, the structural simulation knows that the glider is made of a special type of nylon cloth, and it knows from the CFD simulation the aerodynamic forces which are pulling and pushing on the glider. And by combining those two informations, the material properties and the forces, the aerodynamic forces pushing and pulling on the glider, it can simulate deformations. So uh, by seeing these deformations, I can obviously test measures to reduce uh, those deformations or, or those wrinkles. This includes testing different cloth or reinforcement types in the simulation. Maybe you are able to spot in this uh, screenshot that the this structural model of the wing includes the rods in the leading edge. So, yeah, uh, and and if not, uh, I'm going to tell you now that the wing includes rods of even of different diameters, different stiffness. So I can, in this simulation, try the effect of different rods of different cloth types. That, that and, also means you can, for example, um, simulate using nitinol or different polyamide monofilaments. Uh, yeah, basically, uh, basically, yes, but the I mean, the, in the simulation, the only difference uh, in between a nylon or a nitinol is its different A modulus, its different stiffness. So in the simulation, it basically comes down to that uh, one millimeter diameter nitinol rod acts exactly the same as a 2.5 millimeter, roughly, nylon rod. But other than that, in the simulation, it's the same. And in real life, it's also basically the same because the, uh, yeah, the most important parameter of the rods is the rigidity. And you can either increase the rigidity by using a more rigid material or by increasing the diameter. OK, thanks. But yeah. So. Yeah, every every simulation uh, method has its limitations, and this the limitation of this um, simple structural simulation is that it's only one way coupled. That means in real life, what happens on a paraglider is, uh, for example, you pull the brakes. First thing which happens when you pull the brakes is obviously the shape of the glider changes, but the changed shape of the glider leads the airflow airflow to flow differently, which then again uh, leads to different forces acting on the glider, which again leads to a different shape, and yeah, that goes on until infinity. And this coupling is, uh, yeah, it's obviously implemented in our real world physics. So it's a bit difficult maybe to even imagine a world without this coupling, but it's quite tricky to implement it uh, in the simulation, into the simulation. But once it's done, uh, it's a very powerful tool. So, and that's then called FSI, which is the fluid structure interaction. And you need it for, yeah, and, and it predicts reality a lot better. And for very small def deformations, it's not crucial, but for big deformations, it's absolutely crucial. So, and big deformations are, for example, breaking the glider, using the speed system, or most spectacular, maybe uh, inducing collapses or uh, waiting until the wing collapse, collapses. I will. Is, is that 
um, fluid structure interaction? Is that something that every simulation tool can do? I mean, it's something every fluid structure interaction simulation can do. Uh, but the, the very simple answer would be no. It's quite so the the it's it's quite tricky to um to get it done in the simulation because like I said with the maybe the the easiest example is this um gradually applying more and more brakes. So yeah, what if you fly a trim speed and you pull a bit more brakes? Um yeah, in 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 real life, yeah, naturally in real life this um this coupling is implemented into the real life physics, but to do this in the simulations, what what you have to do is you start with the this trim speed glider and then you pull a little bit of the brakes which has to be done in this structural simulation environment, but then you have to go back into the fluid simulation environment, compute the forces which are now acting on this slightly deformed glider, uh, go back into the structural uh, simulation and apply the forces you just computed of this slightly deformed model and so on and so forth. And yeah, that's a lot more tricky to implement then this simple structure interaction which is basically a one-way coupling so you compute the forces in the cfd simulation acting on the glider and put it into this model and see how it deforms and that's it but if you try to simulate uh breaking the glider you get crappy results because you need this uh um this coupled loop or this loop so you're coupling. going back and forth of back and forth and back and forth all the time or exactly several steps back to move forward again um no no you you go you go gradually you you pull the you pull the brake one centimeter or whatever until the trailing edge deforms just a little little bit then you go into the fluid dynamics simulation, compute the uh, new aerodynamic forces, which will have slightly changed because of the of the uh, the slight deformation. Then you go back to the structure simulation, uh, compute the new deformation, pull the brakes a tiny little bit more, and then go back to the um and then go back to the fluid simulation environment and it's obviously not me going back and forth but an automated uh, script and automated software going back and forth yeah brian is asking whether the your simulation takes the account uh takes into account the elasticity of the bridle the elasticity of the lines yes um yes no, the, from, from the bridle the i'm i'm the uh, bridle to me is the line setup but what to use the maybe, bridle maybe brian maybe you can you can you can ask your question more specifically so so it's easier to understand what 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 you mean or that that easier for us to understand what you mean but Other people you, you go on and I, I ask the question again Okay, but for this, uh, but uh, this answer, I think it can be answered in a general way. Um, for this kind of structure simulation, uh, every part has to have some elasticity. So, uh, otherwise, uh, otherwise, this simulation method uh, could not be done without assigning. Uh, elasticity to every part of the glider and that includes 
the lines and the rods and the cloth and everything else. Yeah, and and the answer is yes. He was talking about the lines. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. For, to me, pride is the sum of all lines, but maybe it is. I'm not sure if that's. Yeah, that's what right. I was guessing. I wasn't sure, but, but okay, you get yeah. it right. <laughs> okay, yeah. So yeah, the the lines like. Um, every other part have elasticity assigned to them. I, I, otherwise, this uh, kind of simulation would not work. Yeah, so with this with um, with this tool, I can uh, simulate a break input. I can, yeah, or actually, uh, the, I have to go back then to the TFD simulation multiple times, and I can then visualize the this wingtip vortex with brake applied with brakes applied. Uh, and, and the <clears throat> most spectacular example of what we can do with this kind of simulations are collapses. I think it's quite obvious that in real life, what happens with a collapse is this very rapidly changing interaction of you change the, 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 the shape of the wing changes, therefore the uh, aerodynamic forces changes, which then again change the glider uh, shape again the forces and so on and so forth and yeah that's what we can do and we can basically do two types of collapses like in the real world we can induce collapses which uh, are those three sc screenshots by pulling the a risers like you would do uh, in an SIV or for the certifications of the wing. That's from the simulation point of view, basically the same like pulling the brakes. The simulation doesn't care if you pull the A-lines or the brakes. Or I can also decrease the angle of attack until the wing basically naturally would collapse. Or I can... Yeah, I can decrease the angle of the of attack by pushing the speed system in the simulation and then test how far I can push the speed system and then check when the wing uh, when the wing collapses and how it collapses. So I can um, use it to increase the stability and to improve the collapse behavior. So what are the advantages of this fluid structure interaction? I will uh, try to explain it on three different examples. So it allows me to judge what kind of deformations actually do harm to the performance and I can uh, decrease those deformations in case the harm is big. In this screenshot, you see a full speed Mentor 7, uh, real life wing and uh, simulation. You see the they match very nicely. And in the simulation, I can now have a look at how much those wrinkles do harm. In this case, the answer is very little. And the reason for this is the wrinkles are very close to the stagnation point. And as you might know, at the, right at the stagnation point, the um, airspeed, the, the, the speed of the airflow is zero. And yeah, a bit further from it, it's uh, still not too high. And yeah, therefore those wrinkles do very little harm. And the measures which would be needed to reduce those kind of wrinkles uh, might then do more harm at let's uh, say trim speed than the accepting those wrinkles at top speed do harm. I can also use the 
uh, FSI simulation to optimize the brake pressure and the flare behavior. That's something I've made use of on uh, current development of a B-place glider uh, and another wing. Um, there are many ways to affect the flare behavior of a wing, but even if we leave the canopy totally aside and only focus on the brake of a uh, of a glider, let's say the brake per side consists of uh, 25 uh, single lines. I can basically change the length of all those 25 single lines and every change will have some effect on the flare behavior of the glider. And I can add on, I can't only, cannot only change the length of those lines, but I can also change their position. Uh, so where they are attached to the canopy. And uh, in the and you get a really really large number of possible combinations, and some of them are, or most of them are not reasonable, but the, even the possibility, the, the reasonable possibilities are very very high, and so it's quite difficult to get the optimal solution in this seemingly simple problem, and a good way to get closer to the optimal solution is go step by step. So basically change two line length, see the effect if the flare behavior gets better, uh, keep this change, try another change. If it gets worse, try another change and go step by step by step by step. The uh, advantage is in the simulation that it not only works uh, quite fast, but I can really see reliable the effect of those small changes, even if the effect is very small. So what I do is basically I in the simulation, I pull the brakes uh, um, a certain amount and then check in the simulation how much the lift increases. And the effect of those small changes would probably be too small to even detect it in real life. So if you did this small change on an actual wing, did a landing and tried it after a small change, the difference might be too small to, uh, to even notice it. But if you add 10 such steps going into the right direction, the uh, improvement is quite substantial. And yeah, and in the simulation, I can easily uh, decide if the step went into the, the change went into the right direction or into the wrong direction, and then incrementally, step by step, uh, achieve a better flare behavior. And the third okay, example. Stop, stop. There, there, yes. There's one question that belongs exactly to that point. Um, talking about the brake pressure, um, Grazia wanted to know whether you can also, um, whether the simulation helps you to identify the, I mean, you can you can predict the, the, the brake pressure, mm -hmm. but can you also predict how, how, how agile the wing will, will feel when, when pulling one, like, like going in turns? Um, I mean, I can, I, I, I can't predict how agile the wing uh will feel and I uh, one limitation I can and I can't properly no I, I can't properly simulate the effect of the brakes on the agility that's a that's a, a limitation of the kind of simulation environment we are using so um it works very well for predicting the brake pressure it works very well for uh, predicting the lift, which is produced, but it doesn't it it doesn't nicely work to get an idea of the actual turning behavior of the glider. No, but it works nicely to get an idea of the collapse behavior of the glider, uh, and Actually, there's again a, a limitation. It works nicely for the um, first 
initial moments of a collapse. That's, and the further the collapse progresses, the bigger the deviation in between uh, real life and simulation gets. That's uh, that may be comparable to a, a weather prediction uh, where the one day weather prediction is going to be very accurate, but the 20 day weather prediction is usually not very accurate because very small inaccuracies or very small mistakes add up in the simulation, in, in the initial stages add up and yeah, lead to a bad prediction. And it's somewhat similar with the collapse. So we get a very good idea of the uh, initial collapse stages. Yeah, here you see this frontal collapse of a wing in uh, an uh, ion 7 prototype, which was optimized with um, these software tools, with the simulation tools. Um, and if in the collapses, so for the collapses, the in, luckily the initial moments are the most crucial, most defining ones. So being able to predict them is a huge help. And for the collapse, we are looking for two things. One thing is obviously we want uh, the wing to not collapse, uh, even at uh, low angles of attack, even if you push the speed for a lot. And in the end also, if you fly through turbulences, but if the wing collapses, we are using, we are looking for a certain kind of collapse behavior. And this is mainly determined by where the wing kinks, so whether, how the wing deforms, basically. We don't want the wing to uh, deform or to, to collapse violently by this. I mean, I don't want the wing to tuck like a rigid wing turning upside down but I want it to uh, deform quite far in the front, at least in the center of the wing, because uh, yeah, that, that in the end leads to a way gentler collapse behavior, uh, less height loss in case of the frontal collapse, more gentle reopening and yeah, less height loss and less rotating and less violent reopening in case of the side collapse. And yeah, again, you see here with, and the, these uh, arrows show these deformation lines, these kink lines, that's how we call them. And yeah, you see the high degree of, uh, you see how well the real wing matches the simulation wing. And yeah, and of, it's obviously a huge benefit if I'm able to try many, many different methods in the simulation to uh, create the desired collapse behavior. So that means you can both simulate or predict to a certain extent how um, collapse resistant the wing is and also how the wing will react if it collapses. Is that right? It's Exactly, yes. And I can, yes, exactly. And I can, yeah. And I can uh, uh, create, or I can induce the collapse in the simulation in two different ways by pulling the ace or by decreasing the angle of attack until the wing collapses, basically. So here is a short video trying that's a video where you've just seen the screenshot of the video of the frontal collapse that's a full speed side collapse on the this ion 7 proto and now you see we'll see two frontal collapses and hopefully you see what I've uh, explained before. So you see here that the wing tips collapse a little bit more violently than the wing center. This leads to the center opening very fast before the tips open. 
And this not only prevents the wind from shooting, it also the most reliable behavior to prevent cravats because the situation where you get a cravat is when the wing tips open before the center. So the, the tip flies and goes in front the canopy. But if the center reliably opens before, the tip and not the other way around. It's the best way to prevent collapses, uh, to pre prevent cravats, sorry. There's another full speed frontal collapse here and you see the behavior is pretty similar. The Yeah, and that's uh, obviously a huge advantage to be able to do a lot of this uh, optimization in on the computer already. What it basically leads to is what I said in the very beginning, uh, the design of a paraglider basically comes down to um, combine all those parameters in a, a reasonable way. Uh, as close as possible to the optimal way. And there's a, the, what I call here search space is enormous, of course. It can because there, there are so many different ways of setting those parameters and there are so many different ways of combining those uh, different parameters that yeah you can uh, you can easily get lost. And the more you make use of those of this big search change, uh, you obviously can gain a lot, but the, the risk is quite high because if you change basically everything, the wing will most likely not fly. And but the better the software and simulation tools predict the wing, the more risk you can take because in the end you don't take a lot of risks because uh, you will find out right away on the uh, computer what works and what works not and the more predictive of reality um, the simulation tools is the bigger my search space is if you if you imagine having no simulation tools at all the only reasonable way to um, develop a paraglider would be to go really step by step because if you change 10 things at a time and on, on a wing if you change its curvature its airfoil its opening and let's say the wing twist or whatever uh and if the wing then doesn't fly you don't even know why it doesn't fly so uh you have lost a prototype a lot of time and uh you even haven't gathered a lot of knowledge because if you change too much, you yeah, and it doesn't work. You don't you, you don't get a proper idea why it didn't work. Um, and so, without simulation tools, the only reasonable method is to go step by step by step to change the curvature a little bit from one prototype to another, and then change the airfoil to the next prototype and find out what works and find out what doesn't work. But yeah. In the end, you can only do small steps from one proto to another and also from then one finished wing model to another. And yeah, with the with those sophisticated simulation tools, my search space is very big and therefore I can uh, make bigger steps from one prototype to another than I could ever before and find out what works and what doesn't in this simulation uh, stage. And, so do you, yeah. do you still experience like really big surprises uh, when, when, when making a prototype in, in real and fly it compared to the simulations or is it, is it close by? I remember like um, some, it was 20 years ago, uh, I think it was Mario Eder who once told me that nine out of 10 prototypes were not a major improvement. Um, well, now it seems that you know exactly what what to do. Yes, it now now it's now nine out of ten virtual prototypes are not an improvement. 
but uh, most real life uh, prototypes are improvement. The, it depends a bit on the glider. Most difficult are the acro gliders. <laughs> I don't know in case uh, Terry Blick is listening. Um, but I mean, we are we are constantly progressing with the with our simulation tools, and therefore currently really most of our real life protos are often quite considerable uh, considerably improved from one generation uh, to another but the surprises are still there they are it's the the uh, it's it's not like i uh, put the uh, virtual glider into all those simulation tools and find out everything about it. And the job of the test pilots is just to uh, just to confirm what I found out in the simulation. There are there are many limitations to the simulations. I could uh, I, I could easily talk equally long about uh, what we can't do in the simulations. What what the, are the, the the biggest limitations that you face? Just not to name all, but the the, the biggest ones. Or the biggest one the the biggest one limitation um let me think mm. well, if you want to it's get on, one more it's feature... on, on the on there are the there are limitations there are limitations on uh on on dif on on different stages the uh, the let's start with the let's start with the production of a glider i am um, i can create I, I, in the simulation i can create whatever shape i want regardless if it's possible to properly sue such a shape for example and for example, I can uh, on the computer create very small radiuses, which uh, might look beneficial in the software to have an airfoil with a very sharp edge in the front. But when the most skilled sewer with the best sewing machine would try to recreate this shape, which I super smoothly created on the computer, it would look ugly and it fly would fly way worse um uh, yeah it, it it would fly way worse than uh, what the what i simulated and um apart ap apart from that the the surprises and the limitations get smaller but i mean we immediately put our focus always uh, on the limitations so it certainly doesn't get boring um can you can you just switch off your your, oh, yeah, uh, of your screen because we're, we're all saying the big, big question mark and we yeah. keep on talking um with, with ourselves a bit bit bigger um there's one question from from Brent, um, which which comes from the um, PP, uh, PPG wings um, powered paragliders, mm -hmm. um, and he wants to know whether you think that we will see reflex profiles um, on free flight wings too, or increasingly, or maybe you can ex explain first what the reflex profile actually is, why you so, use it on uh, on PPG and mm -hmm. why. Um, a, a, a drawing would make things a lot easier, but so, but I'll try without the drawing now. Um, a standard air foil is uh, bent in just one way. So the, the, the most uh, the, the most simple air foil is a symmetric air foil, and the most simple change from the uh, symmetric airfoil is uh, to simply bend it downwards. And what a reflex uh, airfoil is characterized by is it, it has a double bend. So, and that leads, and this double bend basically uh, acts 
like the tail wing on an airplane. The what the tail plane on an airplane does is when the airplane pitches down downwards, the uh, tail wing will uh, induce a pitch momentum, which leads to the uh, airplane pitching up again. And that's exactly what the reflex airflo uh, airfoil does. So um, tail less wings, I hope this term exists in English. Uh, or mono wings, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, they uh, all have to use uh, reflex airfoils in a, uh, and the and normal airplane with the uh, with the tail wing doesn't have to. And on the paraglider, it's the same. Uh, the, the, F, the, the reflex airfoil uh, has a huge amount of pitch stability. So it's when, whenever the whenever the uh, angle of attack decreases to a bit below a certain amount, it immediately wants uh, to increase this pitch, or it immediately increases the pitch. The downside of uh, reflex air foils is that this standard, uh, this continuous uh, pitch momentum decreases performance because it's basically the rear section of the airfoil is creating downforce while the uh, front section of the airfoil is uh, creating lift in, to put it in very simple terms. And yeah, that creates, that's less performant than uh, not creating downforce, obviously. But reflex, there, there are as many different reflex airfoils as there are many different non-reflex airfoils. So you can have very pronounced reflex airfoils or less pronounced reflex airfoils. We have been uh, also recently experimenting with them quite a lot, not uh, uh, just in certain sections of the glider i mean in the quite obvious which section is the the wing tips so it's uh yeah we, we are not forced to uh use the same air foil on the, throughout all the wingspan uh but yeah we can change it however we want and yeah so we have been experimenting and also successfully experimenting been experimenting with reflex air foils uh but Never to the extent where I assume most EPG wings uh, uh, use them. I mean, they are they are visible. They are visible by ju just looking at the wings flying by, and it wouldn't make sense for a free flight wing to use it to that extent because it we don't have a, a, a thirty horsepower pushing us through the air. Yeah, so, but, yeah. so the answer is basically um, may, a, a little bit yes, if it makes sense, like to, to use that self-stabilizing momentum yes. of, of mm -hmm. a reflex profile, especially on the wingtip so they don't come forward too fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, they, or, they, or, they, yeah. Or, or they collapse less, but we won't see PPG airfoils on the cross country gliders yeah and and um how long does it actually take to design a new wing and and do the simulations and manufacture the prototype i mean of course you're working on several projects parallel mm -hmm. but if, if let's say so, you uh, you've got nothing else to do and you do one wing um how how fast do you progress and um and I mean, so a very case, how far can you how quickly can you make a new wing a, a realistic a realistic best case scenario for one prototype cycle, which includes design simulation work, sewing the paraglider, and also flying it, is around one month. So, I mean, the, of course, the, the variance is huge. Uh, sometimes I'm 
uh, there are in some very simple cases I'm done in uh, one or two days if the change is obvious and just needs one simulation validation it's done very quickly and but usually I would give an estimate of uh, one week minimum but yeah those are just very rough guesses that vary a lot and then sewing the prototype takes one week in a very best case for a uh, quite simple prototypes prototype and they are longer for more complex prototypes and testing depends on the weather obviously but to get a first impression yeah takes a couple of flights couple of flights in thermals so a, a very op quite optimistic but still somewhat realistic rule of thumb is that if we build one prototype the if we if one prototype arrives the next one could arrive uh, uh one month after the first one has been tested or after the first arrived actually sorry okay and and concerning the test pilots um has their their job somehow changed um due to the use of of um, the simulations um or is, is it the same it has become more boring more challenging do they have to sense more or it's uh, i i would say it has uh changed a little bit because now some part of the work uh consists um contributing to calibrating the simulation methods so uh yeah i mean like i said the simulation software is uh, a constant uh, yeah we, we we try to make constant progress and yeah in the end it's about predicting reality so the best way to calibrate it is by calibrating it with reality or the only way to calibrate it is, is to calibrate it with reality and the and and we do this on different stages the most simple stage we calibrate it is but uh, we did it is in the very begin in the very early stages for example for the structural simulation we took very simple cloth pieces did some standardized pulling elongation uh, whatever tests and did the very same same test in the simulation so that has nothing to do with the wing but just very simple cloth pieces and now uh, but but that's the basis for uh, being able to simulate a wing and now where we are able to simulate collapses on a wing this calibration involves doing uh, replicating some changes that i did in the software for example uh try side collapses with two different trim settings or with uh, two different types of rod reinforcement and then check how well the simulation corresponds to real life and in case it doesn't find out why it does not i mean that's then uh, more my job but this uh, calibration work is obviously something new which uh, didn't have to be done before but um, besides that may, what might have also changed is the the focus for in case of the ion 7 we uh, entered the practical uh, with the very first prototype we we entered the practical tests on a quite high level so the the collapses were really good on the first prototypes and the test pilot could for example then focus to fly full speed through uh turbulent air uh and in, in case you uh think that's uh some marketing claim uh we did a video documentation of that which um, i think we will uh, release at some point soon uh yeah so they tried to they tried to collect collapses by <laughs> flying full speed through turbulent air to yeah, f find out the range of uh, real life collapses and 
that's something which you need the resources and the time for and the simulation tools gave us more freedom in that regard yeah, there's, there's one interesting question from, from Hamid Totunci from Iran. Um, and obviously, his question is, re is related to where he lives. Um, do you calculate um, what the effect of the cloth getting older um, actually has an effect on, on, the, on the wing? Do you, can you simulate like high porosity as well? Um, we... No, uh, so, uh, porosity is not considered at all uh, in the simulation. So the, there is there is zero porosity, which uh, the, the effect of porosity down to very bad values would not have a significant impact. So uh, it would be totally unnecessary to simulate the porosity. Uh, and the aging of a glider uh, is way more affected uh, in, in 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 most cases it's way more affected by the class losing its stiffness than by the class uh, uh, increasing its porosity so the porosity it, down to 10 seconds on the uh, gdc porosity measurement device actually hasn't an effect, a measurable effect on the on the flying behavior. It's more many it's it's more a correlation than a, than a, a actual causal effect. On the check you measure the porosity of the glider, but uh, the porosity of the glider correlates basically with the cloth getting weaker and softer and that's actually what changes the uh, flying behavior and not really the porosity itself so okay. yeah and we can simulate and uh, like i said before we can simulate uh different types of cloth quite well so uh, it's quite easy to increase the elasticity for example of the cloth and uh, see how certain wrinkles uh, increase or decrease mm -hmm. um, a question from brian is um a lot of designers are using glider plan for designing the wings mm -hmm. what is the advantage of you of using your own software um we we were using glider plan for a couple of years and it's uh, I, I think it's the only commercially available uh wing designing software the advantage of using the own software has a lot of aspects. Um, one aspect which was somewhat surprising, or yeah, or which I haven't anticipated, is that uh, being involved in to the development of the software. Uh, led to me finding out that I actually uh, didn't understand a couple of things as well as I thought I understood them because when you are required to understand things on a level which are necessary to really implement it on a software, uh, you need to uh, really understand them. So uh, being involved in the uh, development on the software drastically improved my understanding of uh, quite some aspects uh, of yeah of paragliders so that's one not so obvious question uh, not so obvious answer to this question and uh, be, beside the, the obvious answer to this question is um, the our own software looks exactly the way we want it to look. <laughs> So any feature, any feature which I want to implement and which is implementable uh, uh, can be implemented. And when I use somebody other software, I am uh, more restricted to 
yeah, uh, what this other person or these other brands want. Um, and and it so, so Gl glider plan is uh, most uh, obviously most people have no idea how uh, uh, glider plan looks. This commercial software, it's 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 a quite nice software, and within a thirty minutes introduction, uh, each of you could create something that looks like a nice paraglider. It has a nice graphical user interface. You can create lines by just clicking on the screen where you would like to have the lines. Um, it has really nice renderings. You can change the curvature by moving um, some buttons on the screen. So it's very easy. So uh, it's, it's very easy to use, but um when you have a deeper understanding of the design you do less profit the the the, the profit diminishes of uh, this nice graphical user interface and maybe you want some parameters coupled with each other in a certain way i don't know you you want the cell with follow a certain a certain algorithm or you want the wing twist depend on the curvature in a very certain way or you want to change the airfoil automatically if you change some other parameters or stuff like that and yeah you can implement all of this in the known software and in the end it leads to very very different gliders theoretically you can uh theoretically you can create uh, all the gliders which i am creating now in glider plan equally but practically you can't because you can't manually adjust those thousand parameters that would be needed to be adjusted okay and if you i mean this this obviously is a lot of calculation done by the computer um what what is what is the calculation time for for the different methods and how powerful is is your computer do you use do you have your own stuff at Nova or do you use external resources? No, uh, we have, uh, we have uh, two uh, simu dedicated simulation computers. It's nothing super crazy. It's like a 2000 euro uh, hardware. And the simulation uh, time uh, varies a lot depending, depending on the task. The most uh computational uh the, the most uh, yeah, computational uh intensive simulations are like i said before this fluid structure interaction and for it to to simulate uh one of those collapses i showed before takes again it, it varies a lot yeah let's say three hours for something like that sometimes more sometimes less but that's about it so i can roughly simulate i, I can try 10 different setups uh and after 24 hours they are uh, i i did I, i'll get I, I can evaluate the 10 different collapses something like this Okay. And but many but many simpler simulations obviously run a lot faster. Yeah, um, Robert is asking: with all the simulation possibilities, do you still build prototypes with multiple attachment loops for the lines, like um, three or five loops for the for one B line, or is that yes. something of the past? No, no, we uh, we still do this. Um, one one reason is these uh, extra loops are so cheap to put them into the prototype so even if we uh, even if we make use of them just one out of five times it still makes sense to um to have them 
And secondly, that's a very fine tuning thing. Sometimes we move the, the for example, so, so the, the, what Robert is referring to is we have cordwise multiple loops. So for example, we are able to move the B lines two centimeters further in front or two centimeters further to the back. And that's a, and see the effect of the glider. So that's a, that's a, a very, a, a very small, already fine tuning change. And of course the simulation shows them, uh, the, the simulation reacts to those changes, but not in, but the correspondence to the reality is uh, not in all cases accurate enough to not need those loops. And again, they are so cheap that it would be, it's so easy to just add them to a prototype by default, basically. Uh, yeah, we still use them. Okay. And Rick is asking, what kind of quantitative measurements do you do during test flights to validate your simulations? Um, the, uh, quantitative measurements, yes, or, or measurements yeah, in general. Quantitative, he was asking, yeah. Qu quantitative measurements. So, uh, yeah, taking taking pictures and videos and comparing it is not exactly a quantitative measurement, but a qualitative measurement, but nevertheless an uh, an, an important one. And uh quantitative measurements we rarely um measure the forces acting on lines uh, break lines or something else and compare it with the simulation but that simulation works very precisely so yeah we we don't need that so much and uh the most sophisticated qualitative measurement is uh we are yeah it's a it's an ongoing it's an ongoing development we use a uh a, a performance measurement probe uh which we yeah which we use to uh actually measure the glide ratio it's but i i, I don't want to uh, go into detail too much yeah because it's yeah it's it's more, more more tricky than we thought but those are actually the only two quantitative measurements we do in flight uh yeah this this, this probe includes speed obviously uh yeah but those are the only two quantitative measurements we do okay um so it's a uh... 13 minutes to nine. So um, I just browsed through the last open questions. Um, there's another one from, from Rick. Um, he's asking, you could use the simulations to find the sensitivity of flight behavior to production tolerances. Have you optimized the designs to a lower sensitivity to production tolerances or line shrinkage? Um, well, the another limitation of the uh simulation is it doesn't really uh, actually it doesn't at all simulate what happens in the production so i mean what what happens in the production is uh different flat parts of cloth is sewn together and in the simulation we have a 3D shape of a glider which does not consist of seams and which therefore also doesn't con yeah it doesn't include seam tolerances uh or stuff like this. So the only the only thing we do in that regard in the simulation is uh a change the cloth behavior and change the line length and see the effect mm -hmm. what what which which kind of wing or which category of wing or which which um kind of wing is is the most difficult for you to design as you said it's it's the acro wings the acro <laughs> <laughs> 
because yeah because uh because the because uh the what what theo does with the with the wing and what i am uh what i am able to simulate has very very little simil similarities or even touching points so um yeah the the yeah it doesn't so so what i can simulate doesn't predict what happens uh to the glider in actual acro use so and and be, be, besides that i mean the, the the focus on different wings is different and obviously i uh, put uh, way more effort into finding maximum performance on a performance wing like the uh uh, mentor or the xenon then i would put on a uh in a glider so um so lower category wings are basically easier to make or to develop i mean not it's a, it's a different it's a different focus you can uh on uh the the the, the, the yeah the focus is really really different on a on a lower category wing it's for example on the on the iron 7 which is uh, some somewhere in between i did those extensive simulation uh, collapses and a lot of uh, resources went into this uh but that's that's actually that actually doesn't answer the question which is more difficult it just answers the question which is uh, more uh, time consuming um it's any wing is equally different uh the difficult the the the, is, the 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 more you change the more difficult uh it's it gets if you want to uh <clears throat> if you do a facelift of an existing wing it's always uh quite easy and you don't need to think very hard and the more you are trying to change the uh or like as I, I i put it before the bigger the search space is the more difficult it gets and that applies to a bantam and that applies to a mentor and that applies to a school wing and the xenon equally why why you decide to or what what criteria are valid when you decide whether you will do something completely new like you have done on the mentor 7 and on the iron 7 or whether you will keep and um, work on an existing platform and, and just um, improve what you already have when do you um, when or why do you just take this or that decision yeah uh uh, the, the different reasons for the decision the the the, the reasons for the uh, mentor 7 or the ion 7 certainly uh, was wing designer our design software so uh first of all the those previous wings don't even exist uh in wing designer so I was kind of forced to start with something new, but it wasn't the main reason. The main reason was was that with uh, those drastically increased possibilities I have, uh, it uh, it would have been stupid or it wasn't necessary to do some incremental changes on already existing wings but yeah to make use of the uh bigger search space and uh and and find a new and find a new and, yeah and find new solutions um on the on the other hand i don't know it's it's from 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 my today's point of view it's quite conceivable that the um mentor eight i mean i haven't thought about the really thought about the mentor eight yet 
but from today's point of view, it's conceivable that the mentor eight will be way, way, way closer related to the mentor seven than the um, mentor seven is related to the mentor six. Maybe sometimes it's sometimes there are cycles when you when you start with a totally new platform. Uh, you won't be able to use the platform's full potential immediately. So maybe it makes sense after using a, uh, after starting with a new, uh, let's call it platform, to then try to find the full potential of this platform and all its details in the further stages until until you until you either have the impression that you have used the full potential of the basic design properties or until what happened in case of uh, iron 7 and mentor 7 or until you have uh, drastically increased either know-how or simulation possibilities which lead you to make use of those possibilities and which then leads to something totally new. Yeah, so let's let's take the last question, um, hopefully with a short answer. Um, can you say how, oh, that's from, from Victor, can you say how many prototypes on average you guys usually uh, need, to, need to make before you're really happy with the final model? Mm -hmm. The best that's case, also... worst case, from two. <laughs> I think I... I won't mention them. I I I am not sure if I'm going to mention the worst case. Uh, <laughs> if I want to mention the worst case, um, but if I, in average, without taking in account the two or three worst cases, um, the average is around five, maybe. But I've, I mean, I, I have to mention that, uh, um, that that we change quite a lot on prototypes. So, I mean, obviously we change, we, we can change uh, full line sets on prototypes. We can change therefore the the curvature and the trim a lot. Sometimes we also in in recent times we uh, quite regularly uh, changed the wing tips, which might be the outer five, six, seven cells of the glider. And so I, and then I, I still call this one prototype. And yes, and sometimes we test a pro one prototype for month with lots of lots of uh, different modifications. And we can also do uh, quite a lot with uh, on the on the sewing machine here. Do rough changes that will then be implemented nicely on a new prototype. Yeah. So a, a, a prototype doesn't mean we take one wing out of the box, and if we don't like it, we build a new one. But a prototype means very often uh, we fly it and repair it and sew it until it literally falls apart. <laughs> <laughs> it's good that I'm not a test pilot. Are you testing yourself still? Yes, yes. I mean, I fly. It, I mean, that, 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 uh, that means I fly uh, all the prototypes I built, uh, excluding the uh, the acro prototypes. Um, yeah, I, I think there hasn't been a single prototype, a single recent prototype. So I, I haven't flown with. Yeah. So yes. Okay. So I would say let's let's come to an end. Um, there's obviously some unanswered questions, and we have to apologize not to be able to answer all of them. But um, we want to limit it to 90 minutes, and we already have 89. So uh, we're, we're close to the end. Um, we, we hope you like the Nova Insights, and especially this rather technical presentation from people. People, thanks a lot. I, I also learned a lot. It's all, cool. always interesting. Um, for those who speak German, 
There is a similar um, lecture from people that he held at the TAMIC trade show, and um, we will we will give you the the address where to find it in German. That's without questions, of course, as it was frontal. Um, but it's it's basically the same stuff in German, but more condensed. Um, also, if if you generally like the idea of the Nova Insights, you can you can find um, on 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 our YouTube channel. You find the playlist where you can find all the insights. And if you don't want to miss it, uh, of course, you must subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Um, and, but the best thing, most important of all, generally, never believe all this marketing, blah, blah, from, from all those people like people and me. Better fly the wing yourself and, and find out yourself because if we, if we say it's, it's stable, and and it's not it has a high collapse resistance and blah blah blah. Um, the best thing is to really find out yourself, and that's something we we experience at all the testables. People who who fly the I haven't flown the IN seven yet, but the Mentor seven for me it was it was just stunning to see how how stable it actually is. And um, next weekend, um, Friday to Sunday is Dubai Cup, so um, if you live halfway close, it might make sense to come and really fly those new wings. Because um, you have to like it, and not not the designer and not the marketing guys. So um, thanks a lot, and people, thank you again. Bye bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.